Have you ever looked at your Windows installation and thought, you know what, this thing is looking a little bit bloated? Well, today we're gonna be kicking things off with a community build that takes Windows 11 and throws that bad boy on Ozempic. We've also got a CEO playing personal tech support, a power supply that could power a small city and a lost and found prototype GPU from Nvidia's past. Strap in, this is gonna be a fun one. You know the drill, let's get into it. That's right, the CEO of Gearbox is stepping up to personally help gamers with their Borderlands 4 PC performance issues. This move is coming in response to rampant complaints about the game's PC port and highlights the many challenges of launching a new game. Let's check it out. All right, uh, in the interest of full transparency on this next story, we are running a giveaway on the MetaPC's Twitter account in conjunction with 2K and Gearbox for a PC, a Borderlands 4 PC. In the weekend and change since its launch, Borderlands 4 has quickly become notorious as a PC resource hog, the likes of which have never been seen before. Now, after days of personally crusading against complaints of poor optimization and performance issues, Gearbox CEO Randy Pitchford has taken to offering personal tech support to players struggling for performance. Let's check this out. Now, there were some early reports over the weekend that Borderlands 4 was crushing even the most powerful PCs. A 5090 can't manage native 60 FPS in some scenarios. Publisher 2K put out an extensive list of recommended graphics settings for a variety of resolutions. Pitchford's own contribution has been decidedly more controversial than 2K putting out their recommended graphic settings for the cards. And this is a tweet that really got a lot of attention over on Twitter. Every PC gamer must accept the reality of the relationship between their hardware and what the software they are running is doing. He posted on Monday, the next post, which received a whole ton of backlash. In fact, it got community noted. Let's take a look at the tweet. Readers added context. So this is a community note that was added to people who use X. Uh, it says the main contention PC gamers have is that the game is poorly optimized and Digital Foundry put out a video on that as well. All right, now moving on to his less philosophical tweets, Pitchford has insisted that many of Borderlands 4 players experiencing performance issues are simply demanding too much of their hardware and that many would benefit from turning down the resolution or dialing up frame gen tech like DLSS. However, that hasn't stopped him from moving to offer personal tech support to people struggling. You are being unbelievably insufferable, Randy, one user retorted to his offer. I'm trying to be helpful, the CEO replied before asking, what do you think would be helpful? What would you have me do? Pitchford's messaging is certainly more than a little mixed and likely not helping the reception of the game. I, I agree on that. I think the communication could be way better on this type of stuff. On one hand, he's insisted the game is built well and the users are just demanding too much of their hardware. Now, what I'm really curious about, I know I've got a bunch of people watching this channel that have a lot of different hardware in their systems. Graphics cards, CPU mix, mix of hardware, right? I'm curious what you guys have in your rigs if you're playing Borderlands 4 and what type of results you're seeing. Like I said, I haven't had a chance to jump into the game yet. I've got it downloaded and in fact, I should probably probably leave and go play play some games and stop working today. Probably boot up Borderlands 4, but I'm running 5080 PNY card and then a 9950X 3D in my system at home, which should theoretically be able to play Borderlands 4 pretty dang well. But based on some of the stuff that I'm seeing, I, I, I don't know what to expect. So I'll let you know uh, as soon as I get a chance to boot it up. But in the meantime, let me know what you guys are experiencing at home. Corsair just released a massive 3000 watt power supply, a beast of a power supply that comes with four native 12 volt two by six, 600 watt GPU cables. This is gonna be a game changer for those of you who are looking to build. What I would imagine would end up being a multi GPU setup. Let's take a peek. That's right, this is a gargantuan, that's one way to put it, 3,000 watt power supply from Corsair, coming in at 500 buckaroos, ladies and gentlemen. It comes with four of those native uh, 12 volt, two by six, 600 watt cables, as I mentioned, and my gosh, this is the first power supply from Corsair that exceeds 1,600 watts. This is the latest WS3000. It's got 3,000 watts of power pumping through that bad boy, 80 plus platinum certified, and this obviously is not for your typical everyday run-of-the-mill gaming rig. Most certainly not. Uh, this would be used for obviously workstations, multi-GPU configs, things like that. Uh, this is a standard ATX 3.1 power supply, PCIe 5.1 spec. Its length of 6.9 inches. Nice. Positions the WS3000 as potentially one of the most compact 3000 watt power supplies available, facilitating installation with even conventional ATX cases. Uh, modular design as well, so that should help you out with cable management. This is a classic only in PC building story. Who needs 3000 watts? Well, obviously, as I'd mentioned earlier, some people do, and this is for them. It also shows that some companies are trying to push the limits of PC hardware. You know, the power requirements for new GPUs already are getting out of control. 
this is definitely one that would involve a few GPUs. MSRP, $599.99. And you get a 10 year warranty on that bad boy, which boy, I sure hope it comes with a 10 year warranty. That's uh, there's a lot of power pumping through that bad boy and the price is not cheap. Uh, you can also find it as cheap as $549.99 in certain places online if you're interested in that thing. So check it out if you need a whole crap ton of power. Man, shopping for a new PC sure is crazy. You could walk into one of those big box stores, same place you buy your food and pick up whatever they've got on the shelf and just settle for that. Or hear me out on this one. You could check out Meta PCs. When you order a ready to ship PC for Meta PCs, you're not just getting a box with parts. You're getting a system that's built by real people right here in our Phoenix, Arizona warehouse. Our crew isn't some faceless assembly line. We're builders, gamers, creators, just like you. Every PC is hand built, cable managed, stress tested, and QC'd by professionals who actually know what they're doing and care about getting it right. This isn't a mass production. This is craftsmanship with a freaking purpose. We take the guesswork out of buying your next PC. So when it arrives, it's ready to go. You've got no weird bio settings, no missing drive. Drivers, it's quite literally just plug and play because behind every system is a crew that's obsessed with quality and proud to put their name on every single build. And if you need help, you're talking to the same folks who built it, not somebody overseas reading a script. It's personal, it's local, it's 100% US-based support from people who actually care. So when you order a ready to ship system, you're not just getting fast shipping, you're getting a PC built the right way by a team that you can trust. It's built by us for you. Meta PCs ready to ship, check it out on the website at metapcs.com and now back to the news. If you've bought Corsair PC memory in the past few years, you might be getting a check in the mail because the company is set to pay out $5.5 million as part of the class action lawsuit over allegedly false advertising about the speed and performance of its DDR4 and DDR5 RAM. Let's take a look. That's right. If you bought Corsair PC memory after 2018, you just might be entitled to a share of that $5.5 million class action lawsuit over RAM speed and false advertising. Check this out. This is a class action lawsuit that has been settled claiming that the memory specialist overstated the speeds of various DDR4 and DDR5 RAM kits on offer since 2018, costing them uh, $5.5 million. All right, so let's boil this all down. What does this mean? What happened? Well, essentially what happened is after 2018, Corsair started advertising RAM products according to their XMP speeds rather than the JDEC default. And those JDEC defaults, that's essentially like a global standard for the microelectronics industry. So it's a standard for various components like semiconductors, memory, things like that, ensuring that it's interoperable, reliable, and that everyone's playing by the same rule book essentially across manufacturers. That's what they do. It's a standard, right? And so Corsair was caught advertising those XMP speeds rather than the JDEC defaults. Now, according to the settlement, this is who's eligible for... Uh, this settlement. You could be entitled to compensation if you bought any Corsair DDR4 non-sodium laptop memory product with a rated speed over 2133 megahertz, or this is DDR5 as well, Corsair DDR5 memory product with a rated speed over 4800 megahertz and made that purchase while living in the United States. Here's the dates. Purchase had to occur between January of 2018 and July 2nd of 2025, so very, very recently. The initial terms say that proof of purchase isn't necessary, but without it, you're going to be limited to compensation for five products. So not a fixed compensation amount per claim. Instead, here's how the 5.5 million happens. It will be divided among the successful claimants. It's worth noting that the settlement does not include an admission of guilt by Corsair. It just means the company said, listen, we're sick of being sued. We're done with this. We'd like to settle it. Anywho, if you bought Corsair RAM between January of 2018 and July of 2025, you may be entitled to compensation. And you know what? This is really just a great story about consumer rights and accountability. In the PC building world, especially, we rely on companies being upfront about what their products can do and performance. And we need to be able to rely on that when we're making purchasing decisions. And it is pretty interesting that this covers not just DDR4, but also DDR5 memory, which signals, obviously, it's been going on for quite a while, but all the way back to January of 2018 and maybe even before that. I'm not sure about that, though. 
And really, this lawsuit hopefully sets a precedent for other companies in the space. It means that you can't just slap a big number on a box and expect to get away with it without being able to back it up. A prototype of the GeForce GTX 2080 Ti has surfaced after seven years, and it's a look into what could have been. The engineering sample features more memory and CUDA cores than the version that was actually released. Oh, interesting stuff. Let's take a look at this. It's kind of fun. Now, this is a good example of the fact that the hardware that we get isn't always the most powerful version. I'm gonna get into what I mean by that as we dig into this. Prototype GeForce GTX 2080 Ti shows up after seven years. Turns out, guess what? The 2080 Ti did exist. It's clear that Nvidia changed the name of its new Turing series from GTX to RTX at the very last moment. The evidence supports this as years later, many GTX 20 series samples have started showing up all over the place. Now these things usually show up on forums or eBay or just all over the place, various online marketplaces. We've already seen a GTX 2070, you can check that out, and then 2080 models as well. And it now appears, look at that, we've got a 2080 Ti, which launched later and also had a GTX variant. And this is a Reddit user, Substantial Mark 959 and he stumbled upon a sample of this model. The, the card is labeled as GeForce GTX, but there's no clear visual confirmation that it's a 2080 Ti. Uh, here's a quote over from a gentleman over on Reddit. Buddy gave me this to try and repair because it was not showing an image. Turns out this is an engineering sample. This, so this guy just stumbled on an engineering sample. It's crazy. Seems up until now, the internet did know about its existence. I didn't notice until it was too late. And now I've tried to flash a bunch of different RTX 2080 Ti BIOS with no luck. I guess it will be a conversation piece on my shelf if I can't get it to work. And look at this. You've also got a nice little uh, screenshot of the BIOS here as well, showing that uh, it was developed around July 15th of 2018. Now I've taken a look online and the community is eating this up because stuff like this, I actually really like seeing stuff like this because it's like a peek behind the curtains of hardware development and it ends up sparking quite a bit of conversation, right? Pretty cool stuff. Thank goodness for Reddit and eBay and engineering samples, yay. Have you ever wished your PC was one heck of a lot faster? Well, a community-made version of Windows 11 is taking performance to the extreme. This tiny build fits into just 2.29 gigabytes and aggressively cuts out all of the bloat you never wanted in the first place, like Xbox, Solitaire, and even Windows Defender. Wait, 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 give me back Solitaire. Let's dig into it. That's right, this is a custom, unofficial Windows 11 build, but people are eating this up. Check it out, it's just 2.29 gigabytes and is extremely aggressive in removing bloat. Boy, you love to see that, don't you? Let's dig into it. Cramming the entire Windows OS into an extremely small file is a favorite pastime of NT Dev, and we love to see a master at work. This time, they've crammed Windows 11 into just 2.29 2.29 gigabytes of storage space. All essentials, no fluff. So that is taking 7.04 gigabytes and shrinking the OS down to 2.29. That is insane. That's very commendable. We love to see it, that's good stuff. So what do you do? What do you remove from stuff like this? Well, let's talk about bloat and what makes up a lot of bloat on Windows 11, especially, right? You've got Xbox, the weather app, Solitaire, Office, Windows Update. That's one I guess you could get rid of. Uh, Windows Defender, bunch of drivers that you don't need. BitLocker, Search, Biometrics, Accessibility Features, Audio, who needs sound? Really? You'll be fine. Microsoft Edge and then Internet Explorer. <laughs> and this is great. That was still in there? Apparently so. They were like, screw it, let's ship it. Keep it in there forever. Don't let it die. I'm sure they just leave it in there so they can like keep the trademark alive or something. There's probably some really dumb reason why it is still clogging up Windows. Internet Explorer, fantastic thing to have in Windows 11 now. Now you might wanna think about what you like about Windows 11 before you try to shrink your ISO with Nano 11. There are some practical uses, namely lightweight VMs and very limited functionality required for those and legacy system builds. Now this is an open source project so you can tinker around with it, however, some Someone could also tailor it to their needs. And importantly, it still does bypass Microsoft account requirements during its first boot. So that's pretty cool. Now let's do a little side by side. How big SteamOS? The ISO for SteamOS, 2.9 gigabytes. So they got this Windows 11 <laughs> down to 2.29. But then again, let's talk about Linux. I know everybody loves Linux. Bazite, popular Linux gaming OS, uh, seven gigabytes total. So, I mean, not 
far off from the actual full-blown Windows 11 fully equipped with Internet Explorer. So maybe it's not so bad. Uh, what's the community saying? That's what I want to know. What are people saying all over the Internet? The community's response has been mixed. Some people are absolutely thrilled, saying that this is what Windows uh, maybe, I don't know, should have been all along. I don't know. Just a thought. Microsoft loves to add features, and they add them for a variety of reasons, some of them that I'm sure are good. But I also think that they're not always considering the impact on performance and user control. I, I don't think that's like at the forefront of some of these decisions. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. If you went with something like this, like this Nano 11, it is a trade-off, like no buts about it. You're not just removing fluff that you're never going to use, right? You give up a lot of security and features that come with the official build, but it is at the very least, if you're not even considering this, this is a good conversation starter to start talking about what we really need from operating systems. Here's a comment that kind of hits the nail on the head. I feel like search drivers and audio are also fairly useful to have <laughs> and accessibility if you need it, of course. Uh, let me know what you guys think about this. Are you interested in a uh, smaller version of Windows 11? Would you find this useful? Let me know in the comments down below. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure that you're subscribed so that you can catch videos like this in the future. And let me know down below if you've had a chance to play a little bit of Borderlands 4. If you haven't yet, Randy Pitchford's available on Twitter to help you with your configuration. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you.